I know, right? Great swords. Awesome. I have recently come into my possession quite a number of great swords. Uh, not the highest quality replicas, but uh, pretty awesome nonetheless. And I am taking this opportunity to make a very cool video about great swords, specifically great swords in the 16th century. Uh, I am making this video a little preemptively because I have these great swords <clears throat> because I'm getting married soon, and these are the gifts for my groomsmen. Uh, so I don't want to release this video until after the marriage. Uh, you may also notice that they are in various states of disrepair. I got an awesome deal on them, and I like to think I'm handy enough to be able to put forth the effort to uh, make them presentable. Uh, again, so if you notice a pommel missing here and there, or a quadrifoil missing here and there, that just know that's the reason. Um, but great swords are are really cool. So let's let's start at the basics. What is a great sword? A great sword, <clears throat> as we've mentioned before, trying to organize swords is an immensely complicated thing to do. But basically, a a great sword is any sword that you cannot wield successfully with just one hand. Um, so I have in my hands here uh, a very small example of a great sword, and you can see that you really cannot. It's it is too way too large to wield successfully with just one hand. Uh, in fact, it you have the two-handed grip down here, and then many examples, as we'll get into in a bit, also have. <clears throat> the second grip up here so that you can get much more leverage on the greatsword. Um, so the video here is trying to go over just kind of the thoughts, the basic knowledge and organization of greatswords specifically in the 16th century. I'm sure there are examples of greatswords from other centuries, um, but I'm going to stick to the 16th century one because that's where my knowledge comes from. <clears throat> and uh, two, because that's what the examples I have here are. Uh, so, I wanna jump into it. 16th century great swords, we have two basic designs. Um, one would be from mainland Europe, and the other one almost specifically focused into Scotland and Ireland, and the places those mercenaries went in mainland Europe. Um, so, the first style here, <coughs> ah, very cool. Uh, the modern and common name for it is Zweihander. Zweihander, if you want to Englishize it, Anglicize it, um, which translates to two-hander. Uh, historically, they were known as a beaten hander. Um, <clears throat> this is a weapon almost exclusive to uh, Germany, almost specifically the specific type of mercenaries that came out of the Holy Roman Empire called the Landsknecht. Landsknecht. Um, they were, these were wielded by their specialist troops, the Doppelsoldner, uh, who went to schools and, uh, fencing, and went to various fencing masters to learn how to properly wield a great sword like this. And the Doppelsoldners were used for various reasons, and we'll get into the tactics employed by great swords later on too, but the Doppelsoldners were paid double because one, it required a lot of skill to use this, and two, they were sent into very dangerous scenarios in battles. Um, so there are other variations uh, on various places in Europe that have a similar style to this. Specifically in Spain, there is one known as a montante, uh, and then in Italy, uh, various versions of the Spadon, uh, and some of the specifics of what makes these weapons uh, in this category are these things here. These are known as lugs or flanges, um, <clears throat> and uh, this section here, this double grip that kind of creates a second sword up here is called a ricasso. Uh, so what makes it special, what makes these unique, is that not only do you have this kind of giant swing capable of intimidation and just kind of brutal crushing attacks, almost similar to a polearm, um, you also get the opportunity to wield it up here for much more relatively um, focused and dexterous styles of attack and defense. <sighs> 
These great swords were used, one, you should know that there's not a lot of record of how great swords were used. And unfortunately, that leads to a lot of speculation, um, a lot of rumors and stuff like that. So um, there are three different techniques, tactics that uh, commanders would use great swords like these in battle. Uh, that they would employ soldiers like the uh, Doppelsoldner to go and train specifically for these uses. <clears throat> the first one is the most popular, and I need to let you guys know that there's a lot of speculation that this actually never happened. Um, for this example, I'm going to go grab this one here. Missing the pommel, see? It's one of the, one of the things I'm going to work on repairing. This is a giant sword. It's about five and a half feet long. This is a little bit more appropriate. You can actually see that the metal bends. I am unfamiliar with whether originals bend like that or not, um, but this one definitely would not classify as highest quality. If you're familiar with the poor historian swords, you can kind of see the threading uh, through the end here. But that's fine, it looks really cool too. And this is a perfect example of how the first <clears throat> tactic was employed. Uh, and that would be breaking pikes. Now I want to clarify again, this might not actually happen, but you can see here on the cross guard, there are these kind of loops along the side. And those were arguably used uh, against enemy spear walls in battle, or pike formations. Uh, spear walls, I'm sorry, that's an earlier uh, technique, but the uh, pike formations, the pike walls. That is a very difficult thing to get through, just rows and rows and rows of spikes. How are you going to break that? How are you going to break their line and attack them if they're defended by these spikes? And so soldiers like the Doppelsoldners were hired to charge the enemy lines. Um, <clears throat> again, I think that the, uh, the thought of intimidation is taken out of this thought, but um, people would say that when the Doppelsoldners would charge the enemy pike lines, they would catch... <coughs> <coughs> They would catch the enemy pike in these loops and then somehow snap the end of the pike off. Now there's lots of holes in that theory. Um, one would be, how are you going to get enough force to break a pike head off? A second would be, what do you do if the pike has lingettes down the side to protect it from that very thing? Um, and the other thing is, how are you going, what is the reasoning for breaking off one pike head when you've got a dozen other guys within striking range of you. Um, the other more possible alternative to that theory is that when Doppelsoldners and similar great swordsmen would charge enemy pikes, they just simply use the weight of the sword to kind of push the pikes aside, almost doing a, a, a squad or I guess a, a group tactic. Uh, you'd have three guys, one, one on one side pushing all the pikes that way, one on the other side pushing the pikes that way, and the third one to run in to that opening that was created and just, you know, do some massive slaughter. Which leads us to um, another, the next tactic used by these um, great swords, uh, and that one would be simple intimidation. Um, there is a really cool picture, and I'm going to post it on this video if I remember to stand off to one side or the other. Um, and it is a perfect example, I believe it's by Swiss, um, or it's depicting Swiss soldiers, just three or four guys with these great swords, um, just swinging them like nuts. Uh, and it, it's actually, that's a very common depiction and example of how to properly use great swords. Uh, and it's just holding off this entire enemy force because none of the soldiers are like, I don't want to touch that. Whereas the soldiers allied with the, the Swiss great swordsmen are behind them just kind of making a tactical retreat. These swords are so intimidating that they, only a few soldiers with these swords can hold off a much larger number of enemy forces. Um, so that is that one is definitely guaranteed how great swords were used, 100%. Uh, this third one um, is arguable. Uh, I've rarely, rarely, rarely ever heard um, or read uh, a depiction or, or seen a depiction of great swords being used this way, but they were supposedly used by um, military commanders, personal guards, 
to kind of protect the commander as he went about the battlefield because only a few great swordsmen are able to hold off enemy forces. So, <clears throat> those are the three ways that they were used, arguably, in combat. Um, I do want to get into one more type, because we covered the Zweihander. This one would be an a variation that doesn't have the, the lugs. Um, and there are... Uh, Good opportunity to jump in that to say that there are other variations of long of greatsword in the 16th century. For example, um, the Kriegsmesser, the the giant war knife uh, used by various troops, especially the peasant rebels during the German peasant Re rebellion of the 1520s. Um, <clears throat> just a giant curved one-sided weapon. It's very cool. But this next one is much more popular. Again, missing the pommel. I'll find a replacement. I'm sure a million of you are going, I know what that weapon is. This is known as a claymore. Um, I'm not going to attempt to uh, state the original Gaelic pronunciation, but the translation is great sword. Uh, so these ones were used very similar. Uh, it does not have the, the lugs, so you cannot, or the, uh, or the ricasso. Um, it does have a, a <clears throat> non-sharpened section down here, so arguably you could grab it if you wanted to. Ugh, oily. Um, but I, I doubt that, was hap that would happen because the claymore comes out of a much more medieval style of warfare that you see in Scotland in the 16th century, and that would be clan warfare. Now, that, would be, that means various families and groups and clans who have allied with each other would simply go on raids against one another to build up their own wealth and power uh, or intimidation. Um, and intimidation is where this comes in. This is an immensely intimidating weapon. It is gigantic. You don't want to get hit by this, uh, <laughs> obviously. Uh, so the claymore comes out of clan warfare from Scotland. And you can just picture these giant um, gallow glass and, and Scottish soldiers wielding these things not to actually kill people, um, obviously they would kill them, would they, you know, if they had the opportunity, but mostly out of scare tactics and intimidation, because this is a scary weapon. You want to show off your power, nothing says, I have power, like a big, big sword. Uh, now, Scottish soldiers brought their claymores when they went to wars in Ireland, and then, of course, as they were hired out by various mainland uh, countries and military commanders, they would bring their claymores there as well. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I did want to cover a couple minor little points uh, about great swords too, now that I've kind of gone over the nomenclature and the basics of it. One is a cool little note of mine. Um, as I've said before, I love conquistadors. That is, that is my specialty. I, I want to write a book, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I came across one book Colonial Arms and Armor, something like that, Arms and Armor in Colonial America. Uh, and there was a, a, a caption of one of the pictures that showed a full suit of armor with a greatsword. And the caption said, it is doubtful that any greatswords were used in the New World. And uh, that kind of bugged me. I don't, I don't like when historians make an absolute yes and an absolute no for some things that aren't really absolute. Uh, so... I was reading my favorite book one day, which was The Conquest of the New World, written by conquistador Bernal Diaz as a memoir of his account conquering the Aztec Empire. And just one little sentence there, it said, this knight did great actions with his longsword. And that's in English, and that's reading the Penguin version, which is kind of translated for people who aren't really knowledgeable in history. Um, so I thought, well, that's weird. That's kind of a... What was the Spanish word for longsword? So I look it up, and I find the original Spanish that Bernal Diaz wrote it in, and instead of longsword, the word he used was montante. So you can just picture a Spanish conquistador with a greatsword similar to this, just decimating these Aztecs. The, 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 uh, the context is that the conquistadors are escaping from Tenochtitlan, the capital Aztec city, uh, and they're just running, and so a guy with a montante probably used that tactic that we talked about before and just held off these thousands, hundreds of, of Aztec soldiers 
just himself, enough to be mentioned in a memoir by this guy many decades later uh, when he wrote the book. So, very cool. A uh, minor note, usually Montantes and Spadones have a much thinner blade uh, than the Zweihander. Very minor note, like I said, um, but I, hopefully I'll be posting pictures up on the side as well so you can see along as I, as I bring these up. Um, <clears throat> now the last section I want to say is um, Great Swords in Hema. How do we do this? There's a great book out there uh, written in the early 1600s. I borrowed it from a friend and unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to read it as thoroughly as I wanted uh, about using the great uh, two-handed sword. Um, and it's very cool. There's lots of attacks involving lots of wind-ups uh, and big slashes, which would be a definite way to use it if you're holding off hundreds of troops. But then I see other interpretations online of how to use a great sword um, in, in HEMA, in sparring, and I see some that have various, various guards and, and blocks. Um, I have no idea how to properly use that, and that is something that I need to look into. Um, but it is almost impossible to spar with a greatsword. There's, there's a video I saw very recently where they actually used Boffer, and that actually made a lot of sense, um, because if whether this is made out of synthetic or wood or revited metal, um, you're going to get hurt, because to use a greatsword, there's a lot of force behind it and a lot of speed, and you're going to get hurt no matter how much armor you have on so they used boffers covered in foam, uh, and that seemed to make a lot of sense because he was wielding it just as you would, holding off three or four other attackers wielding smaller weapons. Um, I did want to note there's a popular phrase out there stating that the Zweihander can be used as a pole arm. That is a ridiculous <laughs> assumption. Whether you this this is not a, a pole arm. This is a sword. Okay, I want to clarify that. Um, you can use it, you can, you can stab a lot longer than a normal sword, I suppose, but pole arms are not, the use of this weapon is not a pole arm. The use of this weapon is a very specialized sword. Um, maybe you could use pole arms like a great sword, but you can't use a great sword like a pole arm, uh, or at least shouldn't. Pole arms are definitely involving stabbing with if you happen to be in one-on-one -on -one combat, you can use a lot of swings with a pole arm. Um, however, this one is definitely used for specialized stuff, whereas the pole arm is intended for lines of soldiers uh, marching in, doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. <sighs> okay, rant over. <laughs> um, so let's see, I, I covered what I wanted to cover with these great swords. These are going to be such a blast to work on uh, fixing, repairing, making better. Uh, there's lots of them where the quatrefoils are just broken off, um, or they're missing the pommels, as we saw. But great swords are very cool. A whole lot of misunderstanding revolves around them. So I recommend to you guys to do your own research. And essentially, if you hear something from someone about a great sword, Take it with a grain of salt and do your own research as you always should do. Um, that's all I got for you. I'll catch you guys next time.